All right, so um, no one's here. So <laughs> I'm going to be going through this one by myself. Hopefully people will join as I go. Um, so let's just get started. This is section 4.4. Trigonometric, trigonometric functions of any angle. I can get my screen. There we go. So just to review, uh, if you've watched my other videos over a previous section, so we've got the trig functions. There's six of them. And they're all basically their definitions are all are in terms of a right triangle where you've got adjacent, opposite, and hypotenuse as your labels on the sides. The shortcut is SOHCAHTOA to remember sine, cosine, and tangent, and then cosecant, secant, and cotangent are the reciprocals. Also a review um, is the unit circle. So the unit circle is just a circle with radius one centered at the origin. And so the equations x squared plus y squared equals one, which also is very similar to Pythagorean theorem where your radius or where your, your hypotenuse or whatever is one. Um, which is why we use right triangles and the unit circle together. So if you're looking at angles on the unit circle, we will reference your locations based off of the ordered pairs X and Y. And then you've got your radius that is basically giving you the distance from center. And then the angle is based off of the horizontal axis. Um, and then we can either go clockwise or counterclockwise. So putting those together, this is where we get trig functions in terms of x, y, and then r for the radius. So that way you're not just looking at a unit circle. You can think of it in terms of a circle of any radius or any distance away from the origin. So um, if r is defined as the square root of x squared plus y squared. So you can think of that as coming from the equation for a circle centered at the origin, but you can get that same equation if you use the Pythagorean theorem or if you use um, the distance formula, because those are all derived from the same uh, mathematical ideas. So looking at it from any of those, uh, those three things will get you to the same point. And this is really important for when you go on to calculus and you start talking about polar coordinates because polar coordinates are now, instead of referencing things in X and Y, you're referencing them in terms of a radius and an angle. And you can do the conversions between it using this formula. And then of course using trig functions to find the angles. So this will be ha handy when you go on to polar coordinates for calculus and being able to convert these will make things easier sometimes to do calculus and polar coordinates versus um, x and y in Cartesian coordinates. So anyway, we're still going to be looking at the idea of a triangle. We're just going to be, instead of thinking of it as like hypotenuse and um, adjacent and opposite, it's now going to be terms of x, y, and radius. And you can get the six trig formulas using the same ideas as SOHCAHTOA. It's just different labels. So um, because we're looking at now trig functions in terms of the Cartesian coordinates, there we have different signs. So we can have positive, negative values. Um, you can get some undefined. So this is just, this is from the textbook. It's a nice chart kind of showing what, um, the top chart is kind of showing the opposites. And um, then the bottom is actually showing the different signs of the various angles. So. Uh, probably the bottom is going to be more useful. I usually don't even try to memorize the signs based off of the quadrants. I just draw my triangle and figure it out from there. So um, whatever works for you, I usually don't bother memorizing those signs. So when we're finding these, uh, we're going to be finding values of trig functions in terms of just ordered pairs. We do it in terms of what are called reference angles because then we can convert them to angles that we know about basically between 0 and 90 degrees or 0 and 2 pi because those are the common angles and so we're always going to try to convert any angle we're given into its reference angle and the reference angle is always taken in terms of the horizontal axis and so you're just looking at where is your angle and then take the smallest distance from there to the horizontal and that will be your reference angle. So these pictures show 
various different versions of reference angles um, and then how to calculate them. I don't memorize that I subtract pi or 2 pi or that sort of thing. I just look at the picture and then figure it out from there. So I don't have these memorized. I think it's better to have a conceptual understanding of what's going on and figure it out from there. Same thing with when I was talking about the, the signs here, rather than having these memorized, I focus more on the conceptual understanding of what it looks like on my graph to figure these out. I think that will serve you better than just trying to memorize everything. So we use, I already basically mentioned this, you use reference angles to find um, trig values of other angles um, if they're not in reference angles because it's just easier and then you can rely on your basic trig functions to figure it out. So um, these are the directions from the book. Basically you figure out the reference angle and then you figure out the sign. I do that basically just, um, you know, conceptually I don't use the memorized reference angles. I don't use the memorized signs, so I'll show you how I do it when we get there. But we are going to be using this table of common angles and their trig values. So I have them in both degrees and radians. This is something to definitely keep handy. I usually have a hard time remembering this, and so I always have to have a chart. I used to have it memorized a long, long time ago, but I haven't really had a need to memorize it since then. Uh, as long as you have a chart that you could look up, you can just um, get it. So we'll be referring back to this. So I'm just going to start going through some examples here, and we'll start with just finding the values of trig functions when they're not in quadrant run. Quadrant one, where all the um, basically the reference angles are. So here we have our angle, and you can see it drawn on our graph. So the angle is clearly bigger than 180 degrees because 180 degrees would be going through quadrant one and quadrant two. So we know that our angle is larger than 180. And we know it's smaller than 270 because 270 degrees would be if you were um, right at this location right here. So I already know that my angle is going to be between 180 and 270 degrees. And so we're going to find the exact value of the six trig functions based off of what I have here. And believe it or not, you don't even need to find out what the angle is. <laughs> we can figure out the six trig functions without actually knowing what that measurement is. And we do this by drawing our triangle in terms of the reference angle. So think of this as our horizontal axis. And we have our line going this way. And then this is at negative 12 and negative 5 right here. So we're going to draw a triangle here. And then this is our reference angle, the, the angle between that's basically to the horizontal based off of our triangle. So the ordered pair, our x is negative 12. So I have that distance as negative 12. And then our y is negative 5. So that's our distance for the vertical. So this translates into a right triangle where we have sides of negative 12 and negative 5, and then we have this unknown hypotenuse, or what we call R when we're dealing with these things in plane. So don't worry about the negative signs here. Those negatives, I mean, we can still use the Pythagorean theorem. The negatives here are just going to be indicating the location of the quadrant and will help us get those trig functions. But what we want to do is use the Pythagorean theorem to determine what R is. And so those are the, the two sides, negative 12 squared plus negative 5 squared equals r squared. So whether the, the sides are positive or negative, when they're squared, it doesn't matter. So we get 144 plus 25 equals r squared. So that gives us 169 equals r squared, and then you take the square root, and we get 13 equals r. So now we can complete our triangle 
And so we know that the hypotenuse here is 13, or the radius, if you're going to look at it in terms of our, our circle deal. And then let me make sure that I measure, I label our angle because that angle, which the book references is theta pi or theta, right? It has a, a dash in it. Um, I'm not actually sure how you would say that out loud. Theta prime? I don't know. <laughs> they just use another symbol for it. But that is our reference angle. And the trig functions of the reference angle are going to be the same as the trig functions for our theta here because I've already included the negative signs with my triangle. So we're going to just take everything in terms of my uh, triangle that I've drawn with the negatives and find our six trig functions. So we'll start with sine. And I'm going to use theta because this is going to be the value of theta even though I haven't drawn it in terms of theta, it's going to be equivalent. So sine of theta, um, on the, the slide that I had, I turned had it in terms of like x, y, r, but I still think of Sokotoa and I still think of opposite over hypotenuse. So opposite, my angle that I have drawn on my triangle is negative 5, and then my hypotenuse is 13. So our sine of theta is going to be negative 5 over 13. So I don't need to know what the angle is. I can still figure it out based on that ordered pair as long as you take it back to your triangle. And so we can do the opposite or the reciprocal, which is cosecant. And that's just the reciprocal. So that's going to be negative 13 over 5. So that's already two of them that we've got. So then next we can do cosine, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent side is negative 12, and the hypotenuse is 13. So the cosine of theta is negative 12 over 13. And then the reciprocal is secant. So that would be negative 13 over 12. And then the last one is tangent, which is TOA, opposite over adjacent. So that's a negative 5 over negative 12, which those negatives cancel, we get 5 over 12. And then the reciprocal is cotangent, so that would be 12 over 5. And so from there, we have found the exact value of all these trig functions for that angle theta. We didn't have to actually figure out what theta was. As long as you're given an ordered pair, you can determine the values of the trig functions. You just have to draw your uh, right triangle and then use what you know about the right triangle, the Pythagorean theorem, and you can fill the rest in. So let me do another one here. So here we've got theta, which is now going all the way around, and now we're in quadrant four. So the reference angle in this case is going to be this angle right here. So when I draw my right triangle, that's going to be the angle that I'm looking at. And it's not, you know, the book uses this theta prime or whatever, but it's the same value as theta. So I label my sides based off of the ordered pair. So the x value is 1, so the distance from 0 to that point here is going to be 1. And then y is negative 1. And then I need to use the Pythagorean theorem to fill in that missing angle, or missing side, not angle, the hypotenuse here. So we've got 1 squared plus negative 1 squared equals r squared. So r is that hypotenuse. That's 1 plus 1 equals r squared. So that's 2 equals r squared, which then means the square root of 2 is equal to r. So I'm going to label that hypotenuse as square root of 2. 
So from here, I know that this is going to be one of the special angles. Um, and anytime you end up with like a square root of two, you're going to, it's basically going to be a 45 degree reference angle. So I know that this is a 45 degree angle right there, which means I can even determine that the, the reference angle is 45 degrees. So then the other angle is 360 minus 45, um, whatever that comes out to, 300 and whatever. But we don't need to know that. All we really need to know is our drawing. And then we can use SOHCAHTOA to find the trig functions. Or if you recognize that that's a 45 degree angle, um, you would go to your chart for what the trig functions are for a 45 degree angle. And then you would go to that chart of the signs to figure that out. So this is a 45 degree angle, so to find like sine, cosine, and tangent of 45, we'd be looking at this, and then you would have to figure out your signs based off of the fact that we are in quadrant four right there. Now, like I said, um, I don't have those memorized. I don't do it this way. I don't say, okay, I've got 45 degrees. What are my sine, cosine, tangent? Okay, which quadrant am I? Are they supposed to be positive or negative? I go back to the unit circle. So that's what I will be doing here. So I just use that unit circle to find my sine, cosine, tangent, and then I don't have to look things up. So sine of theta is going to be sine of what I have labeled as theta prime. It's opposite over adjacent, so that's negative 1 over the square root of 2. Now, we do want to convert that. We want to rationalize the denominator. We don't want to have a square root of 2 in there. And this is equivalent to negative square root of 2 over 2. So if you multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 2, then the denominator becomes 2 and the square root of 2 becomes on top. So um, we saw square root of 2 over 2 on that table. And then, let me go back to the table. Sine is square root of 2 over 2. And then based off of our chart here, sine is negative. So we get negative square root of 2 over 2. But I got the same answer just by using the, the right triangle. So that's why I do it this way, because then I don't have to, there's fewer things for me to memorize this way. Rather than memorizing that chart and then memorizing the signs, I can just draw my triangle and go from there. So um, the cosecant is the reciprocal. So I'm going to take the reciprocal of what I first wrote down, and that would give me negative square root of 2. If I took the reciprocal of my equivalent, the negative square root of 2 over 2, then I have to rationalize the denominator again. But if I took the original one I wrote down, then I don't need to. So next, uh, cosine. So cosine adjacent over a hypotenuse. So that's 1 over the square root of 2. So that's going to be a positive square root of 2 over 2. And then the reciprocal is secant. So that's going to be positive square root of 2 if you take the reciprocal of 1 over square root of 2. And then tangent is opposite over adjacent. So opposite is negative 1. Adjacent is 1. So that becomes negative 1. It's negative 1 divided by 1 is negative 1. And then cotangent is the reciprocal, which is still negative 1. So from there, I was able to get my six trig functions just by basically using the reference angle and drawing my triangle and using the Pythagorean theorem. So Paul, I know that you joined in the middle of the previous example. Now you've seen one full example. Do you have any questions so far? Uh, I, I don't. I think it uh, was pretty clear. Thank you. Okay. So 
I will go ahead and do one more of this style and then we'll move on to different types. <laughs> so here, sorry, I'm just readjusting my seat. <laughs> um, we're now in, in quadrant two. And so I'm just going to make sure I'm going to draw that right triangle. and use the ordered pair. So my X is negative two and the Y is the square root of 21. So this is going to give us some interesting numbers because we have square roots in here. Um, this definitely is not one of the special angles that we have in the chart. So the only way to really do this would be to use the, the right triangle method that I use. So first, we need to find our hypotenuse, which we label as R in this case. So um, it's the square root of 21 squared plus negative 2 squared equals R squared. So when we square the square root, those cancel, we're left to 21. Negative 2 squared is 4. So that gives us r squared, that gives us 25 as r squared, and then r is equal to 5. So at least that's coming out to a whole number. So I don't have these like crazy numbers to have to worry about. So now six trig functions. So we'll do sine opposite over adjacent. So opposite is the square root of 21. I always misspeak opposite over hypotenuse. Um, I always say adjacent when I want to say hypotenuse, so I got to be very careful about that. <laughs> so it's the square root of 21 over 5. And then the reciprocal is cosecant. So that's 5 over the square root of 21. Now to rationalize this one, we multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 21. So now we have a square root of 21 on the top, and then the square root cancels in the denominator. So we get 5 times the square root of 21 over 21. And the 5 and the 21 don't reduce. They don't have anything in common. Cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's negative 2 over 5. And then secant is the reciprocal, so that's going to be a negative 5 over 2. And then, oops, tangent is OA, so opposite over adjacent. So negative square root of 21 over, ne over 2. And then cotangent is going to be negative 2 over the square root of 21, which then when we rationalize it, we get negative 2 times the square root of 21 over 21. And the 2 and the 21, those can't reduce, so it does look kind of nasty here. But that gave us our six trig functions. We didn't have to use a calculator. We just drew a picture, was able to use the Pythagorean theorem, and we got all the signs in there correct. So we didn't have to worry about memorizing what are the signs supposed to be in my, my quadrants. So here, what happens if you're just given an ordered pair? So, um, and I didn't want to do all six in this case because we're doing two on one screen. So if you're given just an ordered pair, you have to draw the picture that we did. So we're going to just kind of draw our coordinate system. And 8, 15 is going to be in quadrant 1. So I don't have to draw it to scale. I just have to draw enough to get my triangle. So. I mean, I drew it looking like a 45 degree angle, but I, it doesn't have to be to scale. You just need to know where things are labeled. And so I know that X is eight and Y is 15. So then we need to use the Pythagorean theorem to find 
that hypotenuse there. So 8 squared plus 15 squared equals r squared. So that's 64 plus 225. Now I am going to pull out a calculator for this to make sure I don't calculate that wrong. 289 equals r squared. I'm going to take the square root. I don't know if that comes out nicely or not. Oh, it does. 17. Okay. So when you take the square root of 2, 889, you get 17. I did not have that memorized. <laughs> Once we get over like 10 squared, I know a few of them. I don't have 14 squared memorized, but I have up to 13 and I have 15 squared memorized. So missing side, now I can, I can label it as 17. So now we're just back to what we were doing before where you just use your, your right triangle trig. And we didn't even need to do a reference angle in this case because it's in quadrant one. So our sine opposite over hypotenuse is 15 over 17. And we just want the three main trig functions. So sine, cosine, and tangent. So cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. That's 8 over 17. And then tangent is opposite over adjacent, so that's 15 over 8. So we're basically just doing the same thing that we did before. You just have to draw your picture first. And then from there, use your right trowel. You use the Pythagorean theorem, and then you can fill in. Any questions? Okay. Um, I'm actually going to skip the, the example on the right, because I think this is pretty straightforward. The next examples that I have are trickier, so I think I'd, I would rather spend more time on those so we can really get a full understanding here. So we want to find the exact value of the remaining trig functions. So they're giving us one of the trig functions. Um, and we're given the following conditions. So this involves some more thinking. So we have cosine of theta is equal to 8 over 17. And tangent of theta is less than 0. So that means the tangent here is going to be negative. So um, this might be where you might want to be able to reference the chart with the signs of the trig functions, because that could save you some time. I'm going to show you how to kind of figure this out if you did not memorize that chart or have it handy, just so you can see the process, the logical thinking process behind it. And then for others like this, we can go to the chart because it will make things a little bit easier. But first thing, cosine um, is adjacent over hypotenuse. So I'm going to just draw a right triangle and just label my angle and my adjacent oops, is 8, hypotenuse is 17. Now we actually just literally had the same sort of triangle. We know the missing side is 15 here. But what you would do is once you would draw your triangle, you would use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side. Now we already did that because same numbers as the pre previous example. So this cosine of theta equals 8 over 17 allows us to draw our right triangle. That's enough information for that. Now, the tangent part is how you determine um, where your positive and negatives are. So tangent 
is opposite over adjacent. So to get a negative tangent, you either need to have a negative opposite or a negative hypotenuse. One of those numbers needs to be negative. But we have to be careful because we still have to keep our positive with the cosine. Since cosine uses adjacent and hypotenuse, and that's positive, I either have to make adjacent negative but then in order to keep cosine positive, I need to make the hypotenuse negative, or I have to make opposite negative and then keep the adjacent and hypotenuse positive. Now, the way that this works is we're thinking this all in terms of circles and that that hypotenuse is a radius. We don't have negative radii. The radius is never negative. So that means my hypotenuse can't be negative, which means that I can't make adjacent negative because then I'll end up with a negative cosine. So this means that the opposite needs to be negative. So that will allow me to get a negative tangent because the tangent of theta here would be opposite negative 15 over 17, so that gives me a negative, and it allows me to keep cosine of theta positive. So I'm using sort of logical thinking here in the constraints to figure out where I have to put my negative sign. Now, if you have access to your charts, and you, you guys will, you know, you have all of your notes and everything like that, all you really need to go here and then say, okay, where is my cosine positive and my tangent negative? And it just so happens that I have it <laughs> circled. Quadrant four is the only location where cosine is positive and tangent is negative. So that would, if you use this, you'd be able to determine, okay, this must be in quadrant four. And then you can go back and redraw your picture based off of your um, the coordinate plane here. We have to have our point in quadrant four. And then this has to be my theta. So that means my x, my adjacent has to be positive. And that means that my opposite must be negative and then that Pythagorean theorem gets you your radius. So um, my picture is obviously not, the triangle is not in the right shape, but as far as finding the rest of the trig functions, it doesn't matter if my triangle is facing the right direction or not, because I can still find sine and cosecant, secant, cotangent with my triangle in yellow, even if it's not facing the same direction or the correct direction based off of the quadrant. So whichever way you use to determine where your positive and negative are in a situation like this is up to you. You've got what I did in yellow, which is using critical thinking and kind of working through the requirements and what your what you need to make work, or you have go back to a chart, draw your picture from there, and then go. Now, one, I think probably in green using the chart is easier, but what's better for you in the long run to help increase your problem solving skills um, and to get better at looking at requirements and constraints and trying to make things work, especially in engineering or programming problems, Doing it the way that I did it in yellow is going to be better for your problem solving skills. So I'm going to be doing that from <laughs> for the next examples to demonstrate that. But the, the shortcut way, which might be best on a quiz or something like that, would be to use the chart. But I do encourage you to try to think your way through where your signs have to be, because that will, is a good skill to have. So 
with all of that, we have to actually go back to the problem here. We need to find the remaining trig function. So we have cosine and we have tangent. We still need to find sine. We need to find um, cosecant. I'll do that next. We need to find secant and then cotangent. So that way we have all of them. So sine is opposite of her hypotenuse. So opposite is negative 15, and the hypotenuse is 17. And then the cosecant is, of course, the reciprocal. Yeah, I was kind of wondering about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Stephanie, uh, you're showing yeah. the tangent as the same as the sine. Whoops. <laughs> I probably just, I just wrote the wrong number there. <laughs> that should be 8 in the denominator, opposite over adjacent. I mentioned that I always get my adjacent hypotenuse. Like, I'll, I'll say adjacent when I mean hypotenuse. Apparently, I'll write hypotenuse when I mean adjacent. So, thank you for correcting that. <laughs> that is a good critical thinking thing to look and be like, wait a minute, I have two of the same answers. That means something wrong. So, thank you. Any other any other things here that I've messed up on? <laughs> no, the rest of it looks looks good. I, I just okay. uh, I, when you said uh, opposite over uh, adjacent, and then I saw the uh, the opposite the opposite over what was it? Uh, hypotenuse. Hypotenuse. Yeah. Then it was like. Yep. Oh. Yeah. For whatever reason in my brain, I tend to reverse. <laughs> Get them mixed up. So <laughs> shows you're paying attention. That's excellent. So okay. So going back, we've got uh, secant. So secant is a reciprocal of cosine. So that cosine is eight over seventeen. So this will be seventeen over eight. And then cotangent is a reciprocal of tangent. So now that I have the correct tangent there, I can correct that to 8 over negative 15. So good catch there. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have my cotangent wrong, too, and then we'd have issues. So let's look at this one. And this one's a little tricky because now we're not given a fraction. Um, so same sort of situation. We're given one trig function and its, its value, basically, and then this time we know what quadrant it, it's in. So because I know what quadrant it is, it's in quadrant two, I'm gonna just draw my triangle based off of quadrant two. And then make sure I, I label my angle. So to do this with the sine, so sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, and that's equal to 0 0.6. So we have two choices. We can make that a fraction by doing 0 0.6 over 1 and setting the hypotenuse as 1 opposite as 0 0.6. Or we can convert 0 0.6 to a fraction, and we can use maybe like 6 over 10. Or we can use the reduced form which is three-fifths. I personally prefer to convert it to a fraction so that I don't have to deal with decimals when I fill in my right triangle. Because if one of the sides on my right triangle is a decimal, if I did the 0 0.6 over 1, then when I use the Pythagorean theorem, I'm going to end up with more decimals, and it's just going to be nasty. So I recommend that if you have a decimal, you convert it to the fraction, and then you can use a right triangle with fraction labels, and that will give you whole numbers. So if we use the 3 over 5, that's opposite over the hypotenuse. So I can label the opposite angle as 3, and the hypotenuse is 5, and then I can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out that missing side. And this is actually one of those special right triangles that you 
maybe had to memorize in geometry. I know when I was in geometry, I had to memorize all the special right triangles, but this is the only one I still remember, which is a three, four, five right triangle. But we'll go through the, the math here to find that adjacent side or other side X, just so you can, you know, just to demonstrate this. So we have X squared plus three squared equals five squared using that Pythagorean theorem. So that's X squared plus nine equals 25. So subtract nine from both sides, we get X squared equals 16. And then X equals, whoops, not 14, <laughs> four. <laughs> so we get that missing side as four. And so now that I have my complete triangle, then I can find all of those trig functions. So we were given that the sine is 0 0.6 or 3 fifths. The reciprocal of sine is cosecant. And so I'm going to use the 3 fifths and just write it as 5 thirds. And it says to find the exact value, so we want to leave it as a fraction. If you did the reciprocal of 0 0.6, you're going to get um, 1.66 repeating. And exact value means don't write it as a decimal, write it as a fraction. So we're going to leave that as 5 thirds. Then we've got, we can do the cosine. So that's adjacent over hypotenuse. So adjacent is 4, hypotenuse is 5 which then gives us secant as a reciprocal. And then tangent, opposite over adjacent. So that's 3 fourths, which means cotangent is 4 over 3. So I don't think I've made any, I'm, I'm double checking my numbers. I don't see any repeats. I don't think I actually wrote the wrong number in any place. Are there any questions? No, everything looks good. Great. Okay, here's another one and I'm going to get, do this one with that critical thinking, especially because it's giving us cotangent. Um, it's, so we're getting that the cotangent is negative here. So first off, I'm going to deal with this cosecant of theta is equal to 4. So cosecant of theta, if I write 4 as a fraction, I can write that as 4 over 1. So the reciprocal of cosecant is, sec, is sine. <laughs> So that means the sine of theta is 1 fourth, and that is opposite over hypotenuse. So I'm going to just draw my triangle, really bad looking triangle there, but my opposite I'm going to label as 4, and no, opposite I'm labeling as 1, hypotenuse I'm labeling as 4. So now, actually, before we even deal with the cotangent stuff, let's just use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side. So we're looking for what x is. 1 squared plus x squared equals 4 squared. So that's 1 plus x squared equals 16. So x squared is 15. So x is going to be the square root of 15. So I'm going to just label that right here. So cosecant is positive, which means the sine is positive. And so our opposite and our hypotenuse have to be positive. So now let's deal with the cotangent here. So cotangent. is 1 over tangent. 
So tangent is opposite over adjacent. So this is adjacent over opposite. Now cotangent needs to be negative. And because cosecant is positive, sine is positive. And so the opposite over hypotenuse is also positive. Those will both be positive in order to have a positive result. So using that thinking process, that means in order to get a negative in cotangent, adjacent must be negative. So that adjacent side needs to be a negative number for all of this to work out. So that means this is a negative square root of 15 on that side. So that will keep our opposite over hypotenuse positive and it will make our cotangent negative because we'll have a negative 15 over one. So cotangent of theta is gonna be negative, ne negative square root of 15 over one, or just negative square root of 15. And so that gives us our right the sign because it says the cotangent needs to be less than zero. So now that I've determined the signs there, I can find my tangent, which is the reciprocal. So that's going to be a negative 1 over the square root of 15, which when you rationalize, you multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 15. So that's going to be negative square root of 15 over 15. Maybe I should start circling these because I kind of have all these answers all over the place. <laughs> So we've got four of them so far. Last one is cosine. I'll just my, my work is really all over the place here. Try to <laughs> don't follow my mess of work here. This is not organized. Um, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent is negative square root of 15. Hypotenuse is four. And then the reciprocal is secant, so that's going to be a negative 4 over the square root of 15. And that gives me my last two values, and I've now found six, so all the six trig functions. Any questions? Okay, um, here's one that's kind of tricky because we now, same sort of situation, but we're given that the sine of theta is equal to zero. And then the secant of theta is equal to negative one. So when we draw our right triangle, we've got a thing when you're like, well, wait a minute, if one of these is zero, <laughs> what does that mean? This means that we are on one of the axes. So we are either on the horizontal or the vertical in order to get zero, because this means, because sine of theta, if I go back, go way back to the very beginning, and I will use this form, it's y over r. So we need to have a zero there in order to equal zero. So I'm going to use that y over r form. So y over r, and this is equal to zero. Now, in order to get zero, y must be zero, because if zero is in the denominator, we get undefined. So this is telling us that y is equal to zero in our situation in order to get a sine of zero. So I know that I'm going to be somewhere on the x-axis. I'm either going to be over here or I'm going to be over here. So I've got two locations. 
and I need to use the secant to figure out which one I am. So secant of theta is 1 over cosine. So cosine is adjacent over a hypotenuse. So this is reciprocal. So it's hypotenuse over adjacent, which is going to be r over x. And this is equal to negative 1. So we know that y is 0. And we know that r over x is equal to negative 1. Well, if we make this a fraction, it's negative 1 over 1. Now, the radius can't be negative, so that means our x is going to be negative. So we are looking at the location negative 1, 0. And it's basically on the unit circle, so that's why radius is equal to 1. So I'm, in this case, going back to the slide that I had, where you can think of you're, you're using these right here. So secant here I have written as r over x. And so I'm going back to these to kind of figure out, well, what is my ordered pair? Because we're not actually given a fraction. I can't, I don't have a triangle to draw if one of my sides is zero. So I can't draw a circle or a triangle. I have to go back to this particular use of the trig functions and this connection. So once you figure out where your ordered pair is, then you can fill in all the other points. Because now we know what r is, we know what x is, and we know what y is. So we're going to just use these other definitions of the trig functions to fill it in. So Go back. So we've got sine. We've got secant. So from sine, I can find cosecant because that's a reciprocal. So cosecant is 1 over sine. So that's going to be 1 over 0. So we get undefined. So we can't divide by zero. So we actually get as an answer undefined for cosecant. Now secant is a reciprocal of cosine. So we can find cosine by taking the reciprocal of the cosecant, which is negative 1. That also gives us negative 1. So now all we have left to find is tangent and cotangent. So tangent, if we go back to uh, tangent is defined as y over x. So that's y over x. Oops, and I wrote the reciprocal. <laughs> y over x. So our y is 0. x is negative 1. So tangent comes out to 0. And then cotangent is the reciprocal, 1 over 0. And that's going to give us another undefined. We can verify that all of our answers here are correct by thinking about it in terms of the angle. So this is a 180 degree angle here to get to that location. And if we go to our chart, we can look at um, 180 degrees and you can see the sine, cosine and tangent there. And then, you, of course, you can find the reciprocals from there. So you can at least verify sine, cosine, and the values of tangent, and then find the reciprocals to find the other part. Now, if you don't like using the x, the y, and the r from that chart, 
what you could actually do is just literally draw a triangle, <laughs> a right triangle, and just say, okay, y is zero, and just label the side as zero. <laughs> I mean, as long as you know that there's no actual triangle with a side of zero, you can still use the triangle with that label and use SOHCAHTOA. Because I could still say, okay, um, cosine, or I could say tangent is zero over negative one based off of my triangle. Even though that triangle doesn't exist, because we don't have a side of zero, I can still draw it and label it in order to use sine, cosine, tangent, SOHCAHTOA, opposite, adjacent, that sort of thing and not have to use the X, the Y, and the R. So that is completely fine. Any questions? Okay. Um, I do have one more example. I know it's eight, but I've just got one more. So I do want to go through here because this one is an interesting example. Um, so we've got the terminal side of our angle theta lies on the line y equals one third x and it's in quadrant three. So we want to find the exact values of the six trig functions of theta. So let's draw this. <laughs> so if we're, we we want to draw the line y equals a one third x. So that's in slope intercept form. The intercept, the y intercept is zero. So we're starting at the origin. And then we're, if we use the slope, it's up one over three. So I can use that to draw another point. That means if I go in the other direction, I go down one over three. So I've got this line for y equals one third x. Now it says that the terminal side of theta lies on this line. So, that, and it's telling us it's in quadrant three. So it's basically telling us we are looking at this angle right here, where this is our side. So that is theta. And so I'm going to use this ordered pair right here, which is negative 3, negative 1, to draw my triangle. So this will give me my right triangle. And I've got my x is negative and my y is negative. So I'm given an equation. I draw the equation. Then I basically use one of the points on that line so I can figure out where my, my angle is and where my triangle is. I didn't have to use negative 3, negative 1. I could have used a different point on that line, but that comes to whole numbers. So it seems like the easiest point to use. So now we'll use the Pythagorean theorem to get our missing side of R. So we have negative 1 squared plus negative 3 squared equals R squared. 1 plus 9 R squared. So 10 is equal to R squared. So square root of 10 is equal to R. So I'm going to label that as the square root of 10. And now I can find my six trig functions because now I have all of the numbers that I need. So we'll start with sine. So opposite, which is negative one, over hypotenuse, which is square root of negative 10, which we rationalize. That gives us negative square root of 10 over 10. And then the reciprocal is cosecant. And so that will give us negative square root of 10 over 1, or just negative square root of 10. Cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. 
So that's negative 3 over the square root of 10, which rationalized is negative 3 times the square root of 10 over 10. And then the reciprocal, which is secant, will be negative square root of 10 over 3. And then we have tangent, which is opposite over adjacent. So that's equal to 1 third because our negatives cancel out. And then the cotangent is the reciprocal, which will be 3. And then that allowed us to find the six trig functions. So if you have an equation of a line, you can always find the angle between that line and either your horizontal axis or your vertical axis by basically drawing a right triangle based off of a point on the line and then using the trig functions. So um, we'll actually get into that uh, next week, actually, week seven. We do talk about the angle between two lines, and you kind of use this idea where you start using like trig functions to figure that out. So this will lead into that. Any questions? No questions here. All right. Well, thank you. I'm glad that you were able to um, pop in. <laughs> I appreciate it.